Okay, welcome everyone to our virtual uh, program celebrating women of Avalon, past and present. Thank you all so much for joining us virtually. I'm really excited to let you all know that after a long, hard year of being closed, the museum is finally open. Uh, we have uh, lots of new things to share with you all. We've made updates to our permanent Catalina history galleries. We have special exhibition, Titanic, real artifacts, real people, real stories. Uh, special exhibition, Gail Garner Roski, um, Journey to Titanic. Plus, we still have the Elizabeth Turk Tipping Point and Soot and Water on our second level. So please, please, we invite you all to come back and see us in person. Um, so without further ado, let's get back to the reason we gather here today to celebrate Women's History Month. We have invited a special guest to enlighten us all with the history of how Women's History Month came to be. I'm very excited to introduce Susan Danish joining us today from the National History Museum in Alexandria, Virginia, where she is treasurer of the board of directors. Susan is an experienced leader with personal commitment to women's leadership and career insights into products and service targeted to women. Don't tell me I can't sit where I want. Don't tell me I can't be an inventor. Don't tell me I can't be a soldier. Don't tell me I can't be a movie star. I am Anna Mae Wong. I am Rosa Parks. I refuse to give up my bus seat to a white person. I am Tabitha Babbitt. I invented the circular saw. Don't tell me I can't fly. Don't tell me I can't be an explorer. I am Sacagawea. Don't tell me I can't be a scientist. I'm Gertie Teresa Corey. I won a Nobel Prize in Physiology. I am Deborah Sampson. Don't tell me I can't open my own business. I'm Estee Lauder. I started a global empire that now has $7 billion in annual sales. I disguised myself as a man to fight in the Revolutionary War. Don't tell me I can't be a spy. Don't tell me I can't be a journalist. I am Mary Elizabeth Bowser. I'm Amelia Earhart. I starred in over 40 films from the silent era to the talkies. I am Hobita Idar. I was an editor, a publisher, and I even founded my own newspaper. During the Civil War, I was a maid for the Confederate president. He thought I was illiterate, but I actually had a photographic memory. I was shot twice in my first battle and removed the bullets myself. These are just some of the women who have changed history. Don't let them be forgotten. Become a member and support the National Woman's History Museum. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here with all of you. So again, thank you, Julie and Kelly, for inviting me. And um, I used to live right down the road in Del Mar, so it's kind of like coming back to California. But today I'm actually in New York, and in a way I'm channeling Washington, D.C. Behind me is the Portrait Monument, and it's in the rotunda of the Capitol. It's a statue of three suffragists, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, and Lucretia Mott. More about that statue in just a minute. We began with a quick commercial, a PSA from the National Women's History Museum. And I'm sure that there were some women who you knew and some names that were not familiar at all. And that just shows why Women's History Month is so important. It's time for all of us to step back and learn about the many women who have made so many contributions over the decades to the history of this great nation. And now before I go further, I'm going to share my screen and show a few slides. It's so interesting to know that this major focus, Women's History Month, actually began here in California. A group of women in San Santa Rosa began by deciding in 1978 that they wanted to create a week-long celebration celebrating women's history. The group became the National Women's History Project, which is now the National Women's History Alliance. It was an idea that people really liked around the country. And so the group began to lobby to make it a national holiday. And it actually began, it became a national day in February, 1980, 
when Jimmy Carter signed the proclamation making March, the first week in March of 1980, the first Women's History Week. Now, the women had chosen the first week in March because March 8th is International Women's Day. And so they decided that that would be a good time to have our National Women's History Week as well. Fast forward, more lobbying. In 1987, National Women's History Week became National Women's History Month. And every year after that, the presidents of this country have issued proclamations making the month of March National Women's History Month. And here is President Biden doing just that. The National Women's History Alliance leads National Women's History Month by creating the theme that goes throughout the year. And this year, the theme is Valiant Women of the Vote Refusing to be Silenced 2021, which is a continuation for the first time of the 2020 theme. History as we know it is ripe with stories about our forefathers, the many great men who built and shaped this nation. But women have always been about half of our population. And yet mainstream American history finds them really virtually absent. The National Women's History Museum did a study. We studied all of the United States social studies standards to find out how women were treated. And we found that in all of these history textbooks, only about 14% of the figures were women. So really underrepresented. And that's so important because each time a girl opens a book and finds a womanless history, she learns that she is worth less. And it's easy for the boys around her to conclude that because she's missing, she is worth less. So that makes making history more equitable and more accurate, an incredibly important topic. And women are missing not only in textbooks, but in so many other visible historical ways. Only nine of the 91 statues in the Capitol are of women. And three of 129 national monuments. None of the national memorials are about women, but New Yorker Magazine had a little fun with one of them several years ago. So you ask yourself, where are the women? And the answer is, and for the women behind me, the women were in the crypt, the basement of the rotunda in the Capitol. And that's where the story of the National Women's History Museum began. The founder of the museum was a real student of history and kind of self-taught. And along the way, she discovered accidentally that in the basement of the Capitol was this statue. And that just didn't seem right. So in 1995, she founded the National Women's History Museum and decided that the very first thing that they would do is get that statue moved. Now you might ask, the statue's in the Capitol right now, so why was it in the basement? And that's a great question. The statue was actually given to the people of the United States from the National Women's Party in February of 1921. That was about six months after the ratification of the 19th Amendment. It opened on February 14th. It was unveiled with great fanfare. The very next day, February 16th, 1921, that statue went out the front door, down the steps, around the corner, and into the crypt, which was literally a basement, the broom closet, the supply cupboards for the Capitol. And there it sat for 76 years, again, until 1995. Fortunately, legislation was passed to return the statue to the rotunda, and yet there were still some problems. People were concerned. They said, oh, that statue is too heavy. It's going to go right through the floor of the rotunda. So the museum 
contracted an engineer to do a study and they found that no, the statue was not too heavy for the floor of the rotunda. Legislation was passed, but no money was appropriated for it and Congress would not allocate any money. So the women privately raised the funds with donations from across the country. It was about $75,000 at the time to move the statue. And so on Mother's Day of May, 1997, the statue was moved and unveiled and it's been in the rotunda ever since. And so the women said, oh, now let's do something even bigger. We need a museum. We need a museum to tell the stories of the many contributions of women throughout our nation's history. And so they began lobbying and then working for there to become a museum, a National Women's History Museum on or near the National Mall. Finally, and I do mean finally, in December of 2020, just a few months ago, legislation was passed to approve not only a women's museum, but also a Latino museum. We were so excited and very proud of the role that we played over time, but there are still many hurdles ahead and museums take a long time. The African American Museum, which was the most recent Smithsonian Museum that opened, was approved in 2003 and opened its doors in 2016. So we want to move fast and we want to do exciting things. And stay tuned in a couple of months for some very big news from the National Women's History Museum and news that will lead us into literally our 25th year in 2022. But for all of that time that legislation was percolating, et cetera, we became a virtual museum. And that turned out to be a pretty good idea and particularly has proven its worth over the last few years. But before that, it was even very important with a very wide audience, teachers, students, academics, scholars, those interested in history, those who simply want women's achievements to be recognized. We're the most visited museum website in the country. And so I'm glad to be able to share a little bit about it with you today. We have a lot of resources for Women's History Month. In fact, next week, this coming Friday, we're actually going to be doing a virtual tour of the Women's Museum of California. So how about that? Back to California. And in addition, we do a lot of educational work. We have study guides and resources for teachers so that they can bring women's stories into the classroom since the textbooks don't have those stories. And so that's one of the many really important things that we do. We have a great women's journaling project going on right now, coronavirus journaling. And so if you'd like to submit something a day, a week, a month, several months, it can be written, it can be video, it can be music, we're collecting all of them. And at the end of 2021, a selection will be in the New York Times and they'll become a per permanent display of our own. So journal away. And there are so many things that I could tell you about the museum and what we do and how we do it and why we do it. But I'm gonna do what so many speakers do and I get so tired of hearing it. So pardon me for doing this. Check out our website, womenshistory.org. And so I'm going to bring this brief story of Women's History Month and the history of the National Women's History Museum to a close by saying thank you. Thank you to each and every one of you for the history that you create every day and for being interested in women's history. And those thanks come from not only me, but from Rosa and Gertie and Amelia, from Tabitha and Anna Mae and Mary Elizabeth from Sacagawea, from Deborah, from Hovita, and from Esti. Happy Women's History Month. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Susan, for opening our program with where it all began. Uh, I think I'll definitely be visiting your museum virtually and hopefully one day uh, in person. Uh, I hope you will uh, stay around for some questions at the end of the program. I'm sure folks will have lots of them. Um, so let's move on. Uh, Women's History Month isn't just about women who made history. It's also about women who are out there making it. Today, we would like to highlight some of Avalon's strong community female leaders. Throughout today's program, you will hear from the following ladies. I'm Annie Marshall, and I am the mayor of the city of Avalon. Hello, my name is Renee, and I want to thank the Catalina Island Museum and the Wrigley's for letting me be part of the celebration of women, past and present. I am very honored. I'm a longtime business owner on Catalina Island and feel very blessed to have had these experiences here on this beautiful paradise island. My name is Cindy McGugan Cassidy, and I'm the mayor pro tem for the city of Avalon, as well as my husband and I have four businesses here on the island that we own and operate, and my stepdaughter, Lorena Cassidy, and myself operate another business here on the island. I am Rosa Miller, and I am the owner of Catalina Kids. <laughs> yes, I'm Brenda Miller, daughter. <laughs> Hello ladies, hello everyone. Um, my name is Yesenia De La Rosa and I am part of the city council. We asked the ladies um, the same series of questions and I'd like to share some video of those questions and their answers with you now. I have a lot of female role models, but the one that definitely steals the cake for me is my mother. Growing up, she always made the impossible possible and taught me to be kind to others. She plays a huge role in who I've become today and definitely gives me a lot of motivation to push through and help others change their lives. I was raised in a small town in the San Joaquin Valley in the 1950s. And in those days, many of the mothers did not work. Dad was out there, but mom was taking care of the children. Well, my mother worked all of her life, and she told me that it is very important to be independent and to never need a man. You might want one, but to need one is a different story. So she said, Annie, whatever your dreams are, whatever your aspirations, go out and get an education because you can always fall back on that if you get married and decide not to work, but at least you have something to fall back on. So uh, that's why she is my inspiration. And I, as many of you know, at a time in my life, I was widowed and I was the sole bread earner in the family and I was able to support my family. Of course, that's when I lived here in Avalon as community services director, which was, which was fantastic. Without a doubt, I would have to say that that would be my mother, Donna. She was Miss Catalina in summer of 1962 and first runner up for Miss California. My mother shared her passion for beauty, fashion, and design with me. My mother was a high-end hairstylist in Beverly Hills at Pagano's. She styled many famous people and movie stars. My mother inspired me to attend Thousand Oaks Beauty College which I graduated and opened my own salon here on Catalina Island. This was my first business experience. I owned and operated that business for over 10 years with many satisfied clients. I think the most prominent role model for me would be Dr. Jane Goodall. Uh, spent my entire life watching her you know, move around, studying the chimpanzees, growing into this environmental activist, conservationist, um, and her career spanning over 60 years, all the work that she's done, uh, the greatness that she's brought to the chimpanzee community, and just her overall well-being, just you know who she is and what she stands for, and getting out there and getting her voice heard. She is for, for sure my number one person that I've looked up to my entire life. Beth Weishacker. 
and why she was a great lady, inspirational in my life. So this question for me was hard to answer. Uh, reason being is I cannot just choose one. It's really hard to, because the world is full of inspiring women, you know, from all walks of life. I've had women here on the island inspire me, uh, ladies I met during college, a lot of different ladies that I've met in different job positions that I've had before. Um, there's a countless amount of women who've inspired me, I, it's impossible to really just choose one. Um, some women may not even know that they've inspired me. I'm, I'm really observant and I like to take in any small or big, doesn't matter the size, any small or big thoughts, um, interactions, situations, ethics, that will just better me as a woman and as a human. And so I can also pass it down and make it a valuable contribution to anyone, anyone it could help. As a female fitness instructor, one of the number one struggles that I come across is bringing on a stronger male presence when it comes to my in-person classes and one-on-one -on -one sessions. If you know me, I'm all about comfort and making everybody feel right at home. So we would love to have more men when it comes to our boot camps and my one-on-one -on -one clients. As mayor, I don't think the challenges I face are any different than a man that sits in that seat. Um, it is a position in which I believe you need to be, make people feel comfortable and feel that they can approach me. And I think that I do that quite well. Um, but again, I think it's, there's no discrim, I don't feel any discrimination uh, being the mayor in this town. I purchased a beauty shop salon at the Metropole Marketplace. One year later, they decided to build a new hotel, which caused me to have to temporarily relocate to a new location. I was able to reestablish myself at the Glenmore Plaza Hotel, which my customers loyally followed me there. Two and a half years later, I was able to move back into the Metropole Marketplace in the bottom of their brand new hotel in the courtyard. It was amazing. At the same time, with my ambitious nature, I opened a new beachside retail store at the Descanso Beach Club, which with the new recent renovations is one of the nicest, most beautiful beach clubs in California. It is a lovely tropical paradise. Seashore Angels is the only retail store out there. And I have a huge clientele that are absolutely in love with the store. My goal is to provide my customers with all their beach needs to make them as happy and comfortable as possible. Our inventory includes a wide variety of swimwear, beach cover-ups, beach necessities, including floaties and toys for the children. I have been a very happy business owner for over 20 years there. At the Catalina Descanso Beach Club, it's amazing. Gosh, I have been a business owner since the age of 18. Um, part of wanting to start my own business was um, feeling as though I was not treated equally, um, being challenged that I might know something, but I'm not going to know it as well as you know a colleague who's a male or somebody who's older. Um, from a very early age, I strive to want to do something for myself, pave my own way, follow my own path. Um, I've always been very strong and, and individualist, and I've spent so many years in the corporate world just struggling while for male counterparts, for example, just watching them climb the ladder when the ideas might have been mine or the direction might have come from me. Uh, just a lifelong struggle of that uh, drove me into wanting to do things differently and um, ultimately brought me here to the island where now I'm successful as a woman-owned business and um, paving the way for the next generation, including my own kids. Let's see, just trying to keep up with the trends and, you know, trying to be, I don't know, happy. You know, because I'm the one that's here all the time, most of the time. And it's hard sometimes. This one was kind of my favorite question. 
only because it's almost hard to talk about this topic, but something in my heart just wants to jump and say, this isn't right. And a lot of those things that aren't right are very passive aggressive. So it's really hard to pinpoint how it's done and who's doing it. Um, but as women, you know, progression has been made. We know that um, it is slow. You know, around the world, there's a problem of not enough women being at the table. Uh, but I am also very proud that there are four out of five on the dais right now. Part of history and I'm glad to be part of it. Um, I have had concerns brought to me that I possibly may not have enough time for the work that I'm doing right now because I have two children. I know that's a comment that many, 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 many women have heard before. Uh, but for me, now it's motivating, puts more fire under me. I've also received pushback and was told my priorities weren't straight when I supported ideas or voiced concerns from constituents that most are not used to hearing from. Um, you can absolutely feel the resistance and like I mentioned, the passive aggressiveness. Um, but what has helped me realize and keep pushing forward is that other women in these seats, they open the doors for you. Uh, they teach you, they show you that it isn't easy. And I believe it's because they have the same experience and know that there's these invisible obstacles that we have to overcome. And if we don't do it together, you know, it may be a little harder. We could definitely still do it. But if we collectively stick together and help each other open these doors, we'll just become stronger. So I would like to take a minute to uh, congratulate our fearless leader. Uh, Executive Director Julie Perlin Lee. Uh, she was recognized this morning. Um, she was she received an award for the 2020 Women of Distinction um, by Assemblyman Patrick O'Donnell's office. So I'd like to congratulate her and just let her know that you inspire all the ladies at the museum every day, including Johnny, not a lady. <laughs> so congratulations, Julie. Uh, so now I would like to turn the program over to Mr. Steve Junak. Steve worked as a uh, botanist and educator at the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden for 37 years. He made his first coll collecting trip to Catalina in the spring of 1978, where he stayed with a group of botanists at Camp Cherry Valley. In 1995, his efforts to collect plant specimens uh, at Catalina intensified when he teamed up with Mark Caves of the Wrigley Memorial Garden. Steve and Mark made many trips to the island's interior and remote corners, which is why we have invited him to highlight Blanche Trask, who was a botanist and scientist here in Catalina from 1890 to 1915. Unfortunately, I live in a very remote area and not, and not able to join you with my video, but I would just like to tell start telling the story of Blanche Trask who was an amazing collector here on Catalina Island. And she was, uh, before I start Blanche's story, I'd like to tell you about a few other women in the history of California botany who had a major role in documenting the plants of California in the early days. Um, one one uh, major contributor to our knowledge of the, the botany of California is Alice Eastwood who was a botanist at the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco. She and Blanche definitely had a relationship and Alice Eastwood published Blanche's list of plants from San Nicholas Island, uh, which were the first uh, reports of plants from San Nicholas Island. Willis Lynn Jepson was a professor of botany at UC Berkeley for many years. And the photos that we have of Blanche Trask today are from his collection. Also, um, the Brandegees, a very famous um, couple who collected plants in the early days, um, T.S. Brandegee and his wife, uh, Catherine Lane Curran Brandegee, um, they, right after they were married, they spent their honeymoon walking from San Diego to San Francisco, collecting plants along the way. Catherine collected plants on Catalina Island during the time that uh, 
Blanche was here, and undoubtedly they had some connections. Just for some of you who may not be familiar with where the other islands are located and, and the contributions that Blanche uh, made also include several of the other islands in our California islands. There are eight California islands, uh, Southern California islands, including San Miguel, Santa Rosa, Santa Cruz, and Anacapa. Um, Blanche Trask went to both Santa Rosa and Santa Cruz. And also she went to extensively to all four of the Southern Channel Islands, which are Santa Barbara Island, San Nicolas Island, Catalina, of course, and San Clemente. She was born um, Luella Blanche Engel, just after the Civil War in the year 1865. She was born in Iowa, had two sisters. Um, one sister, Laura, was about nine years older and Nellie was about three years younger than her. Their father was occupation was listed as a farmer, but in his obituary, it states that he was also in the milling business with his, with his father and brothers. She came to Catalina Island in the mid 1890s and stayed here until 1915. As you can see from the date she lived, she only lived to be in her early 50s. She lived most of the time uh, in the town of Avalon, but also had a house at Fisherman's Cove near the Isthmus. She collected on the island between the years of about 1895 until uh, early 1900s. In 1909, there was a newspaper article published that said that stated uh, 16 years ago, Mrs. Mrs. Trask came to the island an invalid. Today she can outwalk nearly everyone here. Often during the winter, she walks from the isthmus, taking to the trails, and covers the journey of 15 miles in a little over three hours. She was married to a prominent attorney in Los Angeles, Walter Trask, and he divorced her in December of 1895 after she, uh, he, re, he claimed that she deserted him and went to Catalina Island in October of 1894. Willis Lynn Jepson, who I mentioned earlier, was a professor of botany at UC Berkeley, explored Catalina Island with Blanche Trask in 1908 and they became friends. He, it's his writings about her that give us a lot of information about her and her just her love of the island and her contributions to the botany of Catalina Island. Jepson wrote, no one knows so much about Catalina Island as Mrs. Blanche Trask, who has been here about 17 years. Before she came, the Wheelers were here and were the source of information about the vegetation of the island. I'll tell you about Sophie Wheeler in a few minutes. For the island as a whole, its rocks, cliffs, and canyons, as well as its plants, trees, and shrubs, this woman has a most remarkable love. It has grown out of her love for its wildness, its inaccessible cliffs, and its great solitudes of crest and sky. She has worked through all of its canyons, even on the inaccessible south coast and beyond the isthmus, at all times of the year, but especially in the winter season. It is so intolerably hot in the dry season that she hibernates usually from May to September or October. There's little water on the island, only a few springs, which are frequented by sheep or goats. I have never known anyone anywhere who knows the plants individually over such a large area as she does. She seems to know the individual trees and shrubs like old friends and knows whether they have changed in the last 10 years and how much. If a bush poppy shrub has disappeared from the, the floodbed of Swain's Canyon, she misses it and finally locates the old stump. But above all, she knows the trees, as if she were bent on spending her life in refutation of the assertion that Catalina has no trees. Mrs. Trask has lived so long in the open, he, she has a camp on the south side, that in appearance she does not suggest the woman she is, bronzed by the desert sun. A heavy head of brown, slightly gray above the temples, good features, a happy smile when she is making some quaint joke, brown eyes. She is, she is in her curious shepherd-like costume with the blanket and staff or stick for climbing that she always carries. And here you, on the photo you see of the left of her, you can see her in that 
field costume. He, uh, Jepson describes it as her short skirt, scarcely reaching the knees, the lower part of the leg from the knee up, from the knee down encased in leggings of leather, a tall peak straw hat with broad brim. This costume would be the wonderment of the Avalonians, but that she departs on her trips early in the morning when only a few people are astir and returns in the watches of the night. Here's a, a, a image of her again from um, Willis Lynn Jepson, which is Blanche Trask on the left and her friend, Mrs. Kinney at Middle Ranch. Look at their costumes. You can just imagine um, what a, a stir this would have made in the days that they were out exploring. Unfortunately, Blanche Trask passed away in 1916 and Jepson was one of the few who attended her funeral services up in San Francisco. And he wrote at that time, Mrs. Trask was, as Miss Eastwood, that was Alice Eastwood, expressed it, a wild woman. She had given up all that wealth could afford and the pleasures of a social career to live her life on Catalina. If she had died on Catalina, it would have seemed fitting, but she was buried in a great city with only one or, th one or with only two or three persons present who had known her and no relatives. It seems tragic, and as the words of the service went on, my mind left the confines of the undertaking chapel, and I saw Mrs. Trask once again standing on a high ridge beyond Avalon in the moonlit shadows far in the night in silent worship of the sea and air, completely controlled by love of strange beauty and mysticism. Mrs. Trask botanized ardently on her island. She took long journeys on foot with a shepherd's staff and a bit of food. She discovered several new species and collected many rarities. Besides her collecting on Catalina Island, Blanche Trask also collected extensively on the other Southern Channel Islands during the late um, 1890s and early 1900s. She collected flowering plants, lichens, Native American artifacts, minerals, shells, and other natural history specimens. Her writings about the floras or the plant life of Catalina and San Clemente have added a lot to our knowledge of the early days of those islands. And she also collected scientific specimens on Santa Rosa Island, Santa Cruz, Santa Barbara, and San Nicolas. Her specimens from San Nicolas Island, as I mentioned earlier, were the very first collected from that island. Unfortunately, um, the specimens that she collected, the prime specimens she collected, were deposited at the California Academy of Sciences up in San Francisco. And they were destroyed during San Francisco's 1906 earthquake and fire. Her personal herbarium collection, which she kept on the island, was also destroyed in the, the large 19. Luckily, she had spent, she had sent duplicate specimens to other institutions, and we are still able to study those today. And they are just have an amazing, uh, have made, made an amazing addition to our knowledge of the plant life of all of these islands in that really critical era that she was collecting. Several plants have been named in her honor, including this island deerweed. Those of you who are plant lovers will recognize the uh, pea family flowers. And off on the right, you can see the long fruits, the pea-like fruits that um, hang down from the flowers. This only occurs on San Clemente Island and was discovered by Blanche. This is a loco weed on the left, uh, Astragalus traskii, one of the um, loco weeds that's only found on two of our offshore islands, Santa Barbara and San Nicolas Island. The mountain mahogany on the right-hand part of the screen here is only found on Catalina Island, a wild boar gully. This is the famous um, Catalina Island mountain mahogany. Extremely rare plant, one of the rarest plants on the island. This is the little white forget-me-not, Cryptantha traskii, which is known only from San Nicolas and San Clemente Islands, again discovered by Blanche Trask and named in her honor. This beautiful live forever Dudleya uh, traskii from only known from Santa Barbara Island. This is a uh, yerba santa that is also found only on Catalina Island, up in the uh, highlands of the island near uh, the airport. You can frequently see this in the chaparral. It's a beautiful shrub, again, that was named in her honor. 
And in addition to all of these plants, there also was a tiny little monkey flower that was only found on Catalina Island and is now presumed to be extinct and also named in her honor. Thank you so much, Steve. It's great to learn so much about Blanche. She was a real trailblazer. Um, we will circle back with you at the end of the program with questions. Um, so now let's hear from uh, some of our favorite female Avalonians. I think it's important for women to become leaders because at this point in time, we're finally getting a chance to step outside the box that we've been placed in for so many years and spread our wings. And it's our job as adults to inspire the youth and make changes for the better. Well, number one, if you have children or you know other people, it is good to be a role model for, for, for young people. Um, and sometimes women bring a different perspective to things. You know, I, th I think that sometimes some people can be very black and white. I don't know if it's all women, but I don't feel like I'm black and white. I feel like I enjoy the gray, which sometimes makes decisions more difficult. However, it, I feel it is a much more fair way to treat people by being able to listen to both sides. When I was younger, I had so many women surrounding me that I thought were beautiful, smart, empowering. And even though they may not have held positions that would dictate that, they were who they were. And for each one of them who was part of my life, they, they helped me to pave this way of being strong, independent, you know, get up if you're kicked down, get up when you don't feel good. Um, and so for me, it's important that our next generation and certainly the youth of our community, they know that we are right here paving that way for you. We're here to empower you. It's important for girls to stand up for their rights. It's important for us to work together for equality. Um, you know, women bring a different aspect to the table that we really need to be well-rounded. We need to be compassionate. We need to have what women bring to the table. It doesn't necessarily mean it's better. It just means that it's equal. It's bringing something different that may not be there before. And for the women that are up and coming, I, I see the girls in the high school, I see the colleges they're going to, the, the people they want to be. And it's even inspiring for me being so far down the road from that myself. Because we're leaders, no matter what in life, I, I feel like we're just leaders. It's important for us yeah, yeah, to remind young girls that they can do things because a lot of times they fall into maybe that's for a man to do it mm -hmm. and we can do all things. Yes, mm -hmm. women, yes, we're strong and we're leaders and whatever we do. Mm -hmm. um, having girls, women, ladies be leaders and in leadership roles is important um, more than ever. We are instilled with a different perspective, especially because of the certain obstacles we have to overcome. Um, we also have determination, attention to detail, adaptability, we're intelligent, emotionally intelligent, which is huge. Uh, we do have so many great skills and when we problem solve, it's for the long-term solutions and for community building. So we also have that nurturing side to us as we solve all the problems of the world. After running my business here in Avalon for almost two years now, I feel that my most important role is to influence, motivate, and help inspire people to change their lives for the better. For me, health and wellness is not just about what you look on the outside, it's about what happens inside and where you start from and how you create a relationship with yourself and change yourself from the inside out. So I would definitely say my biggest role is to help people stay motivated and create a greater relationship with themselves. I think the role of the mayor is to represent the community as a whole. And I love that part of the job of being kind of a spokesperson for the good, wonderful things that Avalon has to offer, as well as share what 
what we go through in times like this with COVID. So uh, in a way, I am a cheerleader. I am a very positive person. And I think people need to know that the city is doing okay, but be honest in, in the situation that we're in right now. But I think we have to put a positive, I have to put a positive slant on things. So people have hope. And um, I also believe, since this is a small family that we, we all are a part of a family, to, to, to demonstrate our kindness for other people and um, our willingness to help everybody. Because I think that's kind of what I do in my personal life, and I'd like to think I do that as the mayor. The biggest impact that I think I've had here in Avalon is with the youth. The high school boys and girls that I would employ for the summer months. Training these kids to communicate with customers, to run the register, and minor cleaning of the store at the end of the day. By the end of the summer, they would leave my store with a variety of new work-related skills. It was so fun to be part of, and I really love those kids. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I can't pick one role. Uh, I'm a leader, I'm a business owner, I'm a mother, I'm a friend, uh, I'm a community advisor, I'm a participant. Um, my role is all-encompassing. I don't think I could be successful in any individual aspect of my life if I didn't have all of them. If I wasn't a business owner, if I, I wasn't a mother, if I wasn't a friend, I wouldn't have those experiences to help guide me to do the best that I can each day. Well, I hope I'm an inspiration for young girls. I don't know. And in some ways, I want to automatically just say, be there or be someone who wasn't there for me when I was younger. And I only say that in an aspect of when I was younger, being troubled. Um, it was so easy for people to say or cause, start a reputation for me, made me feel like I wasn't gonna do anything. I was already a failure. And these thoughts happen when I was young, way too young to be thinking those kind of things. So if there is any way that I can step into a young girl's life and let her know, besides the mistakes that you will make for the rest of our lives, because mistakes don't stop, that does not mean that you cannot be anything, you can't accomplish anything anymore and your life just stops there and that you are who you are, because that's far from the truth you're supposed to learn from those mistakes and you progressively get better. If anything, you use those mistakes as fuel, which is what I did. And I'd also like to make our minorities realize that their voice is strong, very strong. I know that we already know that, but when it comes to like politics, for example, there's many times I've been told that it, it is what it is. We work and whoever sits there just makes the rules and we follow them, which is also far from the truth. We have a voice, we contribute, and we make the change. It's so great to learn more about these strong, beautiful women. Speaking of strong, beautiful women, it's my pleasure to welcome Diana Billings Landis to speak about her mother, Lucia Lou Wilde, who was Avalon's first female lifeguard. Thank you, Kelly. Um, wow, this is very inspiring. I um, think I have a new role model in Blanche too. <laughs> um, thank you to all the women that have shared. I love hearing your stories. Mom, this is just maybe a little um, personal story, nothing earth shattering, but my mom grew up in, before I share, I'll just a couple things. She grew up in Venice, California. Um, very modest lifestyle with uh, her family and her brother and they loved the water and the ocean they happened to have some friends who had a Chris Craft boat and they would take them to Catalina Island to fish and dive and um, my mom surfed and just her brother was an LA County guard so you get a picture that she grew up in the water so during the 
World War II, a lot of the men that were guards in LA County were going off to war. And sadly, I couldn't really reproduce these articles. I, Kelly, one of the best things about you asking me to do this is I found all these articles in scrapbooks that I didn't know existed. And this one was gals to stand guard at city swim pools. And mom was one of the uh, women that was selected. They had to go through, you know, a tryout and everything to be an LA County pool guard. So in the early 40s, she was an LA County pool guard. Um, she also uh, learned to aquaplane behind that boat that I told you about. I'm gonna end with that story that happened in 41. But I'm gonna jump now to, from being an LA County pool guard, she was able to become the first female lifeguard in on Catalina Island. So here's a picture of mom in front of her tower. Um, so she's uh, the, oopsie, she's the one here on, right here on the um, right. And this is the tower that's over by the new, where you have the spa now, it used to be the El Encanto. And obviously the tower doesn't look like this anymore. It's just, I think a green platform or something what I remember. But it's sort of fun if you look close, they had her name there, it said Lucille, she was on guard. It was July 17th, the air was 73, water 67, and other, I don't know, these are, uh, I think tides, yeah. So these are a couple of her girlfriends that lived on the island. And um, that she just was so proud of the fact that she was a guard and she'd always show it to us when we came to Catalina. The next picture I have to show you, it had her scribble on it, but I thought it was so cute. It says, um, Catalina in guard suit made by mom. <laughs> so her mom made her lifeguard uh, swimsuit and you can see looking down the walkway over, over here, which would go out to the ferry landing and around to lovers down there. So you can see some of the buildings, maybe I blow it up Holly House and things like that in, in 1946, this, this picture, she was there in 47. I'm not sure how my mom and dad arranged this, but my father, who was a petroleum engineer, they were, they were still finishing college. So she was a physical education major on scholarship at USC and he was on the GI Bill there as well and he was studying petroleum engineer and and geology and somehow my dad finagled a job here's my dad uh with the airlines the seaplanes he wasn't a pilot he just worked in the office so i guess things might have been starting with the uh, the island of romance at that time because here here's dad and some of their friends there's the pier behind him the casino in the distance and there's goopy picture of him and then that's you know where that is that wall um that used to be that what is the name of that store that used to be back there i can't remember um anyways you, i think you guys know where that building is and then um so they were fooling around on the beach and this is she used to often talk about her days off and here they're going out diving and if you look close you can see her ab iron down in her hand and they, I think this is that point kind of right around Lovers. They were headed out to go do some diving. And here is another picture where she got to go on a sailboat on her hour, hours off and got this huge lobster and abalone. Um, so her time in Catalina was, um, was treasured. She told a very sad story. Um, as you as all remember the um, steamer that came through, let's see, just some of her friends. Oh, here, here, I'll back, I should have zoomed ahead here. Um, this is, there's the steamer in the background, okay? And she told the story of a little boy, remember how we, I used to do it when I was a kid, how you'd be down in the water when the steamer arrived and then you'd yell coin up to the people up on the top deck and people would throw coins in and you would dive for them. And this, is this chair okay? Can you see it, Kelly? So, okay. Um, one little boy put the coin in his mouth and sadly she was always so troubled by that that they actually lost him at the time um, from the coin diving. And this picture is, those of you guys are old timers of Catalina, this is Johnny Wegman who was the harbor master um, on the island. And then down below is a picture of mom climbing up into her tower. So. Um, 
after the the thing I also wanted to highlight when I talk about her is this aquaplane race. <laughs> so in 1941, before she came over to be a guard, um, mom was quite the water girl, and um, she learned how to aquaplane board. And she entered the race in 1941. And there are some amazing articles that I found. I guess she was, they thought she would win because one of the articles said, um, hailed as the first girl actually threatening the supremacy of Bob Brown and Don Berry, repeated Catalina Channel Aquaplane champions, is blonde Lucille Wilde, 18 year old Venice High School girl. And they talk about some of her achievements and um, that they were predicting that she would beat these two men and win the race. And what we were always told, and it, you could tell my mom was very competitive, so this really bothered her, but she was in first place the entire race. But when they came over into Hermosa and uh, to finish, they had to make a sharp turn, and she fell. <laughs> and by falling, she got seventh place and only first girl. And I think that just killed her because she mentioned it a number of times. But you know, as when you're someone's child, you, you listen and you pay attention, but it's not till all these years later, I wish that I had talked to her more about these things because she sadly got Alzheimer's disease in the last 12 years of her life. Um, they became distant memories, sadly. But Catalina was still her, just her beloved, beloved spot and we we grew up going over there we had a sailboat and my dad took us and we got to see there she taught us how to dive and get the abalone and the lobster and of course we don't do that anymore right <laughs> um but um anyways this was a real treat to be able to um, revisit mom's life and my dad when he was alive had bought her one of those bricks up by the um where the little playground is, you know, when you come down from the ferry landing, there's a park there and there's some bricks and he got this Lucille Wilde first girl lifeguard. And so we sometimes get to visit that when we come to Catalina. So I won't go on, Kelly, unless anybody remembers mom and wants to ask me at the end, but thank you so much for letting me share. Thank you so much, Diana. Uh, we're so happy to have made this connection with you and we're so thrilled to learn more about your mother. Um, she will forever be remembered here at the Catalina Island. Thank, thank you, Kelly. Uh, another fabulous soul that will always be remembered here in Avalon and at the museum is Dorothy Shepard. I'd like to invite Director of Exhibitions, Johnny Sampson, to tell us all about her. Hello, everybody. I'm Johnny Sampson, um, Director of Exhibitions. I guess you just said that. Um, so I'm going to give a brief overview of this amazingly talented woman uh, who changed the world of advertising and uh, and Catalina. So, um, well, even just a quick little note that that script that I uh, have Dorothy Shepard written in there was designed by uh, Dorothy and Otis Shepard, but we'll get to a little more on that in a second. Um, I'll tell you a brief little bit about her past. Um, so she was born in 1906 in Berkeley. Um, she actually lived on the same street I used to live on when I lived there, uh, just up the street. Um, and her father had a, was a professor over at Cal. He ends up leaving Cal to become a principal of, uh, in a little town south of San Jose called Morgan Hill. Um, Dorothy hated it there. It was too rural for her. Uh, she actually called it Morgan Hell. Um, so in order to get back to life, like city life, she... Uh, kind of fast-tracked her high school years. She graduated as a valedictorian uh, just within three years um, and moved immediately back to Berkeley uh, and enrolled in the California School of the Arts and Crafts. Uh, later that becomes CCAC, uh, still exists in Oakland and San Francisco. In any case, and she, even there she excelled. She graduated there as valedictorian within just three years. Um, that's actually her. Uh, the picture on the left is when she graduated. Um, so after college, she moves to San Francisco, uh, starts immediately kind of this bohemian lifestyle. Uh, she preferred like dressing, uh, or actually we'll get to that in a second. She uh, um, worked for um, the Estelle Reed Dance Company and designed their costumes. Um, that was an uh, avant-garde dance troupe. Um, and she also designed some of their programs. Um, in 1927, so she just graduated from uh, from the California School of Arts and Craft. That's when she was recommended to an artist um, 
actually the, the art director for Foster and Kleiser, which was an ad agency uh, that specialized in billboards. Um, just to put this into perspective, 1921 is when the uh, Federal Highway Act starts. So all of a sudden this money is pouring into the highways. So billboards is a new, uh, kind of a brand new thing. Um, and Foster and Kleiser is specifically uh, working in those. So she gets recommended to the, the general art director who happens to be Otis Shepard. Um, and this is actually that second uh, picture right there is actually her on her, uh, on her honeymoon um, with him. They married just a couple of years later. Uh, but it's story that actually she got hired by them just because she was so, such a great artist and then almost immediately fired because she was so brash, uh, but they needed her skills, so they hired her right back. Um, some other notable artists that just to, so you can see the circle that she lived in, um, the other notable artists that were at Foster and Kleiser were Diego Rivera, Maynard Dixon, um, Fred Ludekins, uh, and then the, the Shepherds were also friends with um, Ansel Adams and uh, Edward Weston, the photographer. Um, he actually takes their picture. Uh, I'll show it to you in a little bit. So she marries Shep and, uh, by the way, that's Otis Shepherd. He went by Shep, just in case I keep saying that throughout the, <laughs> throughout the program. So she marries him in uh, November of 29. They go on a honeymoon to Europe um, and they see all kinds of, you know, this, the European style of art. She had already been focusing her studies with this, this avant-garde work. Um, and they end up trying to, they go freelance. So they had been working for Foster and Kleiser. They go freelance and move to New York. And the first job is for Chesterfield cigarettes. Um, she ends up being his muse and that is a stylized portrait of her. Um, and then she actually airbrushed all the lettering for this and he did the figures. I just want to pause here for a second because we need to talk about uh, her art and their art here. Because um, this is such a great example of the compositional work they were pioneering. Just think this is 1920s, you know, 27, 29, right around there. And this stylized work, this very modern work, um, what we're having here is this, you know, stylized woman, she's gazing at the cigarettes. Um, so of course, you know, if you want somebody to gaze like you like that, you have to have your Chesterfields. Um, and this with a sleek, minimal geometric background. Um, so this is incredibly cutting, cutting edge and powerful. It's, it's modern at the time. So uh, during their time working in the Chesterfields, they both fall in love with New York. They leave um, Foster and Kleiser just to do freelance work. Um, this is actually, and sorry about that center line that I, I had to, I couldn't find this image uh, complete, but um, this is actually one that she did for Folgers. And once again, like it, it's so refreshing, just that stylized rose and then this repetition that you see with the figure um, and the same thing she worked, did another one for Underwood typewriters. And both of those, you get this movement that she's able to do. And it's actually absolutely um, visionary for the time. And that's, you know, she's, that's what she is. Um, and a lot of her work deals with this repetition and yet really intricate designs. And it's one of the things that she ends up bringing to, uh, to Catalina. So in 1932, the Shepherds meet Philip K. Wrigley um, and Shep and him become lifelong friends and they move to Catalina. It's actually a, pictures of them in Catalina, her once again, very bohemian dress. Um, so they, Wrigley wanted to transform the entire island um, into this year round resort. Um, and so he entrusts the shepherds to do this. Um, Otis ends up taking care of, you know, you think of the serpentine wall that goes through. He actually uh, built that, the fountain, you know, by hand, um, the placement of the, the trees, the palm trees throughout the island. And then she is responsible for a lot of the, um, Hold on, it's not letting me, uh... there we go. Um, the signage. So, you know, the bird park signage, or even right now there's a reproduction of the, the, um, the one up by the hospital with the little nurse that's, you know, telling you to shh, quiet. <laughs> so um, those are all her. Um, 
once again, even this cocktail menu, that's her design. See the minimalism and yet this movement that uh, she gets. And so a lot of them, um, they'd work together. She did a lot. She ended up actually doing the uh, uh, St. Catherine, designing all of St. Catherine Hotel. And back to her costume designing days, she designed costumes for the couriers on the ships, the, the band members, everybody you can see her here just with her different costumes. Just amazing the influence she had and the interior design that she did as well. Um, I put this in here because I thought this was fabulous. Here's the Marine Bar at the casino. Um, and then next to it, it's a uh, Joan Miro, uh, who's the famed you know, uh, Spanish artist. He did this in 1946. And you can see you know, that, I don't know. I just think there might be some influence even there. Um, so they were here for about you know, four or six years at the time. She ends up moving back. This, this is the, in Times Square. Um, she actually designs this. This is the Wrigley's Times Square Spectacular. Um, this is actually an image that is from a postcard, but she did this in 36 as well. Um, and it was the largest ad, neon ad in the world at the time. And it took a full, it was a full block and eight stories tall. Um, after that, the shepherds, the two of them split up. So he stays in Chicago and in New York. She comes back to the island for a little while, but this is about the time she leaves um, kind of the design world and moves on to just taking care of her family. She had uh, two kids at the time, one living with her and one not. Um, and eventually she leaves the island, moves to uh, back up to Northern California to a place called Belvedere. Um, he, this, by the way, this is the photograph I mentioned earlier about that Weston, uh, Edward Weston had done of the two of them. This is in 1945, just right before they broke up. Um, on that note, they divorced in the early 50s, and, uh, but they get back together again in 1962. Um, before that, uh, Shep had two houses, one for his mother and one for uh, her in Belvedere. And they end up having a, a rekindling that romance back in 62 and they remarry again in 65. Um, Shep passes in 69. Um, she stays with us until uh, the year 2000. But I just wanna just state how before her time she was, because she's doing this design in, the, you know, once again, she got hired in 27. So the late 20s and through the 30s. So when you think of Mad Men, um, like the TV show that's happening in the 60s, it's such a, a male dominated industry. And here's Dorothy and she's, she's 30 years before her time. Uh, it's just incredible. So, you know, Shep and her are here on the island and he's working with Wrigley um, and, and kind of together, um, the two of them, you know, are, they, they are the ones who designed the American dream. But here on Catalina, uh, they had the vision to design our island paradise. Thank you. It's amazing that you can still see the lasting impacts of her work um, in Avalon today. Um, now I'm going to be sharing some historic photos and video of uh, Miss Emily Parker. Um, in 1924, Emily Parker took over taxidermy service on Catalina, becoming what is reported to be the first female taxidermist. Previously, she had assisted her husband, Charlie, with the business and learned many of the techniques and recipes for the preservation formulas from him. Working um, from their home office in Parker Court between Metropole and Sumner Avenue, today would be between the vet's office and sheriff's office, um, they also established the first library on the island and were the originators of the Catalina Community Christmas tree. Some of the fish uh, she mounted are still on display at the Tuna Club today. And I actually have some video of Miss Emily to show you now.
I hope you guys are all enjoying uh, all of this history. I know our program is going a little longer than it normally does, but for good reason. We have just a little bit more to share with you. Um, Zale Perry is an American pioneer scuba diver, underwater photographer, and actress. In 1954, Perry set the women's depth record of to 2009 feet right outside of our harbor here in Avalon. She is said to have stopped at 209 feet when she reached the bottom of the ocean floor. Zale could not be with us today because she is being honored in her hometown of Milwaukee, Wisconsin at a similar event. So we have invited John Council, the president of the Historical Diving Society and also operates the Avalon Diving History Exhibit Museum here on Catalina Island. Well, thank you everyone. This has been a tremendous program, uh, learning a lot about some really dynamic women uh, uh, related to Catalina Island. Uh, I spoke to Zale uh, just yesterday for her birthday. And uh, so March 19th, uh, 1933 was her birthday. And uh, we spoke for a little while and she was very honored to be considered for this event. And as uh, um, Kelly just spoke of that, she's uh, involved with a PBS special over in uh, Wisconsin, doing the, basically the same kind of thing that we're doing right now. So she asked if I would uh, kind of sit in for her. So I'm honored to do so. Um, in 1995, uh, Dr. Andy Recknitzer, who's uh, considered the Jacques Cousteau of the United States or North America, um, and one of my mentors, we we're at a, a uh, diving event trade show in New Orleans, and he introduced me to Zale in 19, or I guess 94, 95. Um, and the first thing out of his mouth was that Zale is the real deal. He said, there's a lot of wannabes in the diving world. And he said, but Zale, she's the real thing. Um, like I said, she was uh, born in 1933 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And she was born in her grandmother's house during a uh, snowstorm. And uh, they had an heirloom uh, cradle that was stored in the, in the barn. And because of the snowstorm and the snow so deep, her father couldn't get out to it. So he just uh, pulled out a dresser drawer and emptied all the, the clothes out of it and stuck a, a small blanket in there. And, and that's where she stayed for the next several days in this, in this dresser drawer. <laughs> and so it sort of set the stage for her being a kind of a tough as nails kind of girl. Um, and she continued on that. Um, her parents were both pretty athletic. Um, her dad was actually uh, a part of the U.S. Olympic team in track and field, but her mom and father were both pretty avid swimmers, and um, uh, they encouraged her to get in the water at an early age, and, and by the time she was eight years old, she was already a pretty proficient uh, breath hold diver. She didn't have masks or anything back at those times, but um, she would you know, just go down and, and look around in the lakes and ponds and uh, swim down underwater and got pretty pretty proficient at it. And then by the time she was in high school, uh, she became a very, very uh, competitive swimmer in her, in her uh, high school swim team and did quite well and won a lot of awards and, and uh, such in, in that realm. And then um, uh, after high school, of all things, she got hired out in California at Douglas Aircraft. And so she moved out west. And one of the first things she did is she got involved with um, doing some works with the local Red Cross. And so sort of as a little sideline deal, she would do uh, swim class training uh, for people uh, twice a week. And uh, she kept up in her water trades and through that Red Cross affiliation, she ended up working with uh, polio patients of all things. Um, and she would help these polio patients who were doing some in-pool sort of uh, physical therapy work and she would work in the pool and they would lower these patients down in a kind of a contraption and then she would release them and hold them and stabilize them in the water and then kind of walk them around while they could work some of their muscles uh, in the pool and that got her uh, working in this pool environment and um, uh, this is where she did her very first scuba dive in a in a LA swimming pool and uh, she got a hold of one of her co-workers, uh, was a guy that she knew, a guy named Perry Bevins. And later she would marry Perry, but at that early stage, he, he uh, got her onto a scuba rig and she, she started breathing underwater and was absolutely fascinated by it. And that was 1951. 
And within a few years, she'd become so accomplished as a diver that she came out to Catalina Island and she set her world record dive out here uh, just outside Avalon Harbor in uh, 209 feet of water. And she took her little dive slate down and she had to write down her depth. And, and uh, she, the real reason for her to do this dive was not to set a record. It was for her to go down and test a brand new piece of equipment called a uh, Hope Page non-return valve. And what it was was a mouthpiece that had a non-return system in it so that the uh, mouthpiece got dislodged out of the diver's mouth. It wouldn't backfill the hoses with water and uh, it would be a much safer system. So she went down and she actually took the mouthpiece out of her mouth and then, and then replaced it and then tested it out at 209 feet, which is like unheard of for an untested piece of gear. And here at the museum, I've got one of the Healthways <clears throat> regulators that she used along with the whole page non-return valve that, she, that the system that she used to try it out. So it's pretty, pretty, uh, historic piece of equipment, but uh, uh, Zale's a, a good friend and so she lets me have some things to, to show around. Anyway, um, neat gal. Um, <clears throat> so she, she um, did her, her scuba record and then shortly thereafter, she uh, was graced of being put on the cover of Sports Illustrated magazine of all things. And she was wearing kind of a skimpy bathing suit, but she was always a pretty girl and, and very photogenic. And so she got on the cover and here it is right here. I, I know I've got it on the slideshow, but uh, she's obviously an attractive gal and she had this little skimpy outfit. And of course she uh, autographed it for me when she was here uh, last time. And she'll be coming back again in uh, just about a month one month should be here on the, uh, April 22nd for a few days visiting me. But um, uh, anyway, their sales went through the roof with her on the cover and the executives for Sports Illustrated magazine, the you know, kind of lights came on over their heads. <laughs> they said, geez, you know, good looking girls in bathing suits on the cover of the magazine, that, that could be something. And so uh, thereafter they had a swimsuit issue started and, and uh, that was the inspiration for their annual swimsuit uh, uh, issues of their magazines, which is pretty, pretty incredible. Um, a few years after that, she was tasked, uh, she became the third female dive instructor in the world. The first one being Dottie Frazier. And then after Dottie was, uh, Barbara Allen and then Zale Perry became the third dive instructor through LA County. And, uh, she was tasked with teaching a young up and coming, uh, Hollywood actor, a guy named Lloyd Bridges, and there was a program that was being designed called, uh, was going to be called Sea Hunt. And she was tasked with tra training him how to become a diver. And so a lot of people were inspired by this program, which in its uh, debut year, 1958, uh, became a mega hit for television. And by its second season in 1959, they boasted a 40 million uh, viewership uh, per week. And back in 1959, there was probably like, you know, oh, I don't know, 40 million and three TVs in the United States. So they, they had a pretty big sizable audience, obviously, for the show. And it was a huge hit. But Lloyd Bridges was obviously an inspirational figure for a lot of people to, to start scuba diving. Uh, but very few people know that it was actually a woman, Zale Perry, who taught Lloyd Bridges how to dive. And she actually uh, co-starred in a quite a few of the episodes that were filmed on Catalina Island early on. And then as the, the show became more and more popular, they branched out to filming down in uh, Silver Springs, Florida, the Bahamas, uh, some in Mexico, San Diego and things. But a lot of the episodes were filmed in Catalina. And if you see some of the early episodes of Sea Hunt, you can see uh, Zale and Lloyd in different uh, different situations. And there's a lot of Garibaldi and Calico Bass and things like that swimming around. So there's a big tie in with Catalina, obviously, with that. Um, but <clears throat> she's um, a pretty dynamic person and her diving career is, is legendary and everybody in the diving business really knows about Zale Perry. Um, she uh, is now a member of the Women's Scuba Diving Hall of Fame. She's also in the Scuba Diving Hall of Fame. Uh, she's on the Historical Diving Society's advisory board, so I get to work with her kind of regularly through that. She's a Nogi Award winner. Uh, Nogi Awards... Um, are the equivalent of a, an, an Oscar award in the diving industry. And so she's a, a Nogi Award recipient. Um, 
uh, about 20 years ago, she started the International Underwater Film Festival. Uh, she co-authored um, one of the principal diving history uh, pieces of uh, literature there is on the marketplace called uh, Scuba America. She and Al Tillman produced that, that book and it's is, and is utilized by many dive historians as sort of like the Bible of uh, uh, dive history in, in the United States. Um, she's an ambassador for the industry. Um, she has a, a granite bust of her carved uh, and it's set up in the uh, Google headquarters in, in Silicon Valley. Uh, along with Dr. Andy Recknitzer and Jacques Cousteau and Dr. Sylvia Earle, all the real legends in the diving industry have these larger than life granite busts uh, that are there. And um, one of the really great things that she does is she started a Zale Perry Foundation or, or scholarship. And uh, she helps young women uh, all around the country that uh, want to get involved with uh, diving careers or oceanographic careers or anything like that. Uh, they have to apply and if they, if they meet it, they have to be certified divers uh, and uh, uh, they can apply for, for funding to help them through college. And uh, she does a lot of work for a lot of young women around this country. Um, and one of the great things that I'm really proud of is here in the ADHA Museum, I have her photograph as well as a lot of other famous women on, on the walls in the photo section of the Diving Pioneers. And I really, really try to stress um, the importance of the women that were in the early days of, of open circuit scuba diving, because those women were venturing into a completely male dominated domain and they had to really kind of do it better than a lot of the guys in order to win acceptance. And I'm sure a lot of women identify with that same kind of sentiment, but she was one of those cutting edge pioneers that, that had done this kind of thing and really worked her tail off to be accepted in the industry and to sort of earn her way. And she did just that. And so when young oh, children or young teen women that are, or girls that are learning how to dive out here in Casino Point, um, oftentimes they come in here and I make a special point to point these, these women out and tell a little bit of story about them. And Zale does something really fantastic. I don't take advantage of it all the time, but uh, if I have a special young person in here that's really, really interested in the, the women pioneer divers, I'll pick up, pick up my phone and I'll call Zale and I'll tell him I've got little Emily here that just got certified today. And I put it on the speaker and Zaya will sit and talk to them for a few minutes and, and really encourage them to pursue their, their career in diving or, or whatever it happens to be. But she's always such a powerful force for these young girls. And you can see their faces just light up. And I tell you, it's a, it's a dynamic thing that she's willing to do that. And um, it's a real special treat for, for people that venture in here. And I'm, I'm happy to be able to have that kind of connection. So we've got a little slideshow. And if uh, Chris can help me out, I'll show some photographs. But this is Zale in uh, 1943 at 10 years of age. And she was already at that age, a tremendous swimmer. And like I mentioned earlier, at eight years old, she was a a uh, pretty avid free diver, hold her breath and could go down. So scuba wasn't far away for her and, and uh, she was gonna be a natural. Uh, this is 1954, just outside Avalon Harbor. She's surrounded by Navy personnel. This is when she's getting ready to set her uh, world record 209 foot dive. On the far right, some old Avalon uh, residents may remember Cap Perkins. Cap Perkins is a story unto himself, and if you want to learn more about him, I won't go into it right now, but he is absolutely a legend in diving, and uh, he was one of the safety divers during that dive, and, and uh, so he was a tremendous guy, so he's on the right-hand side there, so uh, Cap and Zale were, were good friends back in the day, and you can see this copy of this photograph, Zale also autographed for me. There's uh, Cap and Zale together in, the, in that same weekend, and uh, pretty, pretty dynamic uh, pair of divers there. This is really great. This is the following year, 1955. Very famous uh, male diver, Dick Anderson, who uh, designed some of the very uh, first single hose regulators for the Health Waste Corporation. Um, he and Zale are in a wet sub. That's This is actually right in Avalon Harbor on the deck right out here at the casino building. And they're getting lifted in by a crane and they drove this wet sub and stayed on scuba and they had changed out bottles and everything, but they traveled from Avalon all the way back to the mainland across the channel underwater. So it was quite a big uh, news, news deal.
there they are uh, seated in the in the healthways and and Dick Anderson helped design this craft and uh, pretty neat thing in the casino building right directly behind them. So they had a history of doing a lot of things. Avalon and, and uh, Catalina Island have been huge in the in the diving world as as many people already know and some that don't uh, might be uh, interested in, in learning a little bit about the tie-in with diving and, and uh, Catalina Island. It's always been a mecca for uh, scuba diving uh, in the United States. This is uh, Zale and Lloyd Bridges right out uh, along the, the coast here. And this doesn't look like it's too far. It's just down by, past um, uh, near the Frog Rock area. And, uh, and they're just kind of hand boning it probably on, on the set of the TV show Sea Hunt. And that's just a pretty shot of Zale. You can tell she's just a, just always a, a vivacious, happy, and and uh, uh, energetic kind of personality. You can't help but love her. She's even even more so today. She's a fantastic person. Uh, she did a lot of print uh, uh, advertisements. So this is uh, sort of uh, an ad for I think a swimsuit company. And uh, of course, she she had all the all the goods to to make her a pinup type girl. So she was. Um, uh, in a lot of advertisements for different types of projects, uh, 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 products around the uh, around the waterways. There's uh, her on board a, a, a vessel, and I'm not even sure. I think it's another swimsuit ad, but uh, uh, she seems to always happy doing those kinds of things behind the camera, so or in front of the camera. Uh, this is over at the Marine Land of the Pacific uh, that used to be over in Palos Verdes, and she did a lot of performance shows there in the water and. Uh, this is obviously when she would play around in her uh, mermaid suit, and she's got a couple uh, young guys there. It looks like military guys holding her up, so she kind of hand bowing her for the camera again. Uh, Zale and Lloyd again, and uh, that looks like it's possibly here on the island as well. The, the early days of sea hunt, like I'd mentioned earlier, they uh, filmed a lot of those programs here on the island, and uh, so they spent a lot of time around uh, Avalon and Catalina in general. And there she is, big smiling face, and she's got a Hope Page and Unreturn Valve in her hand, and uh, she's kind of showcasing that. There she is. She's a uh, she's got her spear gun, and her and her float. And uh, again, it was a male dominated sort of uh, activity in the water. The, the guys were all always the spearmen, and and uh, she got right in there with the guys, and she got her share of nice yellowtail and white sea bass and another things out in the water and so she held her own with all the guys and uh, spear fishing tournaments and things like that so she's she was solid in the water there's no question about it there she is in an advertisement I believe it was for Johnson outboard motors and uh, they just wanted a pretty girl to be standing next to an outboard motor but she was more than willing to to do the ad so there she is there's another television show of the 1960s I believe in 1965 it was a program many uh, may remember called Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea and one of the co-stars in the program was David Hedison and she was in one of the episodes and so she's there with him in that show. There she is underwater sporting a spear gun and, and looking like Zale. Here she is uh, last time she visited uh, we we're just walking out of the uh, dive museum here in the casino and walking towards some of the classes that were going on and she was going to go out and do a little lecture with a bunch of the students and uh, all these new dive students uh, from the uh, UCSB program from uh, uh, the college up in Santa Barbara. Um, they come down to, to train here and she does some of the, the lectures and some of the, the history uh, uh, lessons for them. And so it's a great program for the, for the college up there. And this is a bunch of the students coming in and we're kind of hand boning it here in the museum and she's holding the regulator that she's wanting me to show off and she's got the hope page non return valve which is really part of what made her famous by doing that record dive got her on the cover of the sports illustrated magazine which got her popular enough to be able to be the person chosen to, to uh, train lloyd bridges and it just kind of kept snowballing from there so she's kind of showing how it started Anyway, so a group of happy students. And uh, this one's uh, just myself, my brother, Brian and Mike, uh, along with Zale at a, at a uh, trade show over in uh, Long Beach. This is uh, Zale and her good friend, Cindy Rhodes, who's also a, a, uh, in the Women Divers Hall of Fame. And uh, yours truly, I, whenever they come to the island, I always meet them with a bunch of lilies or flowers and stuff and then take them to the rental house and, 
And so that's kind of a tradition for us now. Every every year when they come, I always you know set them up with flowers and a, and a ride to the to the house. Uh, there's Cindy and Zale together, good friends. This is on the uh, cover of Historical Diver Magazine, which is a precursor to our Journal of Diving History magazine that the uh, Historical Diving Society uh, produces. And I'm proud to be part of that program. But um, anyway, this is a cover of Zale a few years back. And uh, we had a, a nearly the entire magazine dedicated to her. And that just tells you a little bit about how important Zale has been in the diving industry. Uh, this is a print ad for a uh, uh, North Hill Garrett uh, diving rig, and she's again they're they're using her fame and popularity to try to sell their products. So you can see that a lot of manufacturers recognize the the value of her her presence with their products. This is a cover of her book uh, Scuba America with Al Tillman. Again, like I said earlier, it's sort of the the bible of diving history in the, in America. And uh, if you ever get a chance to peek at one, or you can come down to the museum and take a look at the one that's on. Uh, at the shop here. Um, anyway, it's, it's a great publication. It's just full of information. Here she's playing with uh, somebody. She actually was good friends with a, a early diver named Riku Browning, who was the guy who did all the water work and the creature from the La Black Lagoon uh, series. And uh, this isn't Riku in the mask, but she's kind of uh, hand boning up a little bit with uh, somebody wearing a, a creature mask. But uh, she and Riku Browning were very good friends. And there's uh, she and, and uh, Lloyd Bridges, uh, not too long before Lloyd's passing, um, but they were obviously good friends for most of the rest of their life um, because of uh, the fame and fortune they both were able to get through that TV program. And there she, there she is. Uh, Zale Perry is considered the first lady of scuba, not because she's the first dive instructor or the first uh, female diver, but the first person who brought real style and grace and and sort of glamour to to a sport that didn't really have that and uh and she certainly brought that and so she's equally at home in a wetsuit or an evening gown and that was the thing that set her apart from really everybody else is that she was just this dynamic personality that was quite a woman powerfully strong um very determined um capable all of, all of the qualities that that you would want out of somebody that would be a, a leader in an industry and then also uh, can dress up for an event and just sort of wow the crowd and uh, she she has it all so she's certainly um, somebody that's a dynamic person there she is on the cover of her magazine um, and we talked about that already so next uh, this is uh, a cover of Waterworld magazine that Dick and Dick Anderson and she were on the cover of that for uh, doing their little submarine uh, jaunt from uh, Avalon over to the mainland. So they, they made uh, history again by doing that. Uh, Cap Perkins that I talked about earlier, a uh, legend then to himself. And this is right before Cap's passing uh, in 2012 when she had, was holding the photograph of her record dive where he was on the right hand side of that photograph. And so um they also remained good friends until his passing but uh she still talks about him today uh this is inside the museum and she's uh go going through an old photo album and, and talking about some of the old equipment and teaching a few people uh about the early days and uh, they're having a ball it looks like uh there's uh zale of course and, and myself and she's holding uh, a book that Mike Rivkin and I uh, published a few years ago, and I'm holding her magazine, and we we're just sort of having a great day together that day. So I love it when she comes in here because she's she's such a wealth of information. It's just a, a grand time to have her in. Uh, there she is, just uh, oh, a year or two ago, and she's beautiful and she's dynamic, and you know I just love Zale. She's great. Uh, here she is with Bonnie Toth at a trade show event. Both uh, are in the Women Divers Hall of Fame and uh, good friends. And there she is getting ready to dive. A lot of people are surprised to hear that here she is at, at 89 years, uh, turning yesterday, and she's still planning her dive trips down to the tropics and heads down to go dive with great white sharks uh, on their great white shark trips at the Historical Diving Society puts on his fundraisers and so she goes down and does lectures and jumps in the water and takes photographs of sharks and and she's still doing it at 89 and how can you not love that there's her granite bust at the google headquarters in uh, silicon valley 
and uh, the artist was able to, to chip away everything that didn't look like Zale and came up with something looks nice. So uh, next, and there she is looking, you know, beautiful as ever. And I'm proud to call her my friend. I, I just absolutely love Zale. Thank you very much on behalf of Zale Perry. It's my honor to uh, represent her today. She's really quite something. Thank you, John. I think Zale would be proud of the job you did representing her today. Uh, I can tell how much you admire and respect her. Thank you. I do have one last clip of the local ladies to show you, and then we will take some questions. In Avalon, the people that inspire me the most are definitely the mothers that take my classes. It's so motivating to me to see these women carving out time out of their day, their busy, hectic schedules to come to my classes, sweat their butts off for an hour, and then go about their day, taking care of their kids, making sure they get their schoolwork done, hanging out with their spouses, running errands and working. It's just super, super inspiring to me to see them taking care of themselves and still putting themselves first. You see the elders like Rosie Cadman that not only was a very good businesswoman, but also a very kind and caring person, and she still is today. You know, I mean, just to pick her out is, is, is something I, there's Muriel Heiss, who has worked her fingers to the bone, carrying trays and, you know, serving food to people for, God, 50 years or wherever, however long that has been. And then you see Diane Stone, who runs that business by herself, but also is the head of the Humane Society. I mean, I don't, I can't. And then you see the young people today, like Yesenia De La Rosa running for, running for council and getting elected. It's, there are so many wonderful females on this island that have their own business or work in incredible jobs like Julie Perrin Lee of the museum. It's, it's Denise Ratty, you know? I mean, she started as a preschool teacher in this town and through those years has worked herself to be the city manager. That's incredible. And that, of course, would be my stepmom, Jackie Hubbard. Jackie is a business owner of Catalina Gear for over 30 years here in Avalon. Jackie taught me all the skills I would need to know, run and operate a new business such as purchasing, window design, maintenance, and customer service. I am forever grateful for the knowledge that Jackie instilled in me. All of her advice was absolutely necessary in me learning to own and operate my own business. I have to say that this has been an amazing journey. It has brought joy and happiness into my life. I would like to thank my clientele and my customers from the bottom of my heart for all their support and all of my endeavors. Thank you so very much. I actually have two very important people um, since I've moved to the island. Um, the, the first person who really stood out to me and was a wonderful mentor was Marie Whittington. Um, if you knew Marie, she was poised. Uh, she was a perfectionist. She was polished and she certainly had a splash of sassy and that's one of the things that really drew me to Marie. Um, I loved spending my time with her in Rotary and learning from her and just watching her. Um, and still today one of the most important persons in my life is Rosellen Gardner. Um, Rosellen just being a strong woman um, with so much love in her heart She's a wonderful mentor to me. She's a person I turn to um, as a friend, as a confidant, as, as a mentor when I need it. She's the one who, who tells me, hold your head up high, put your shoes on, get out there and get it done. And no matter how difficult a situation may be or how wonderful a situation may be, she is there with the same support every time. Dave Stein and Elga, Elga. Yeah, Bowser. Yeah, she was inspirational. She was a world traveler. Yeah. And they uh, made a lot of jewelry. She was a German, German lady. Mm -hmm. 
yes, very stern and very uh, um, business-wise woman. I feel like she had a different look on life than my mom, so she kind of like broke her out of her shell. <laughs> she did. Like the first question I said, it's really hard to just choose one, but the one woman for me would be my mom, uh, Irma De La Rosa. She's been through so much, you know, we all been through our share and I know her story growing up and that alone, you know, is very inspiring. Um, but just all the obstacles I've seen her overcome, you know, recently with the passing of my brother, she is just so strong, so strong and not only strong, but she is resilient. Um, I see her smile still and I can't thank her enough because it has given me strength and I've needed that strength for my children. Um, so thank you, mom. Thank you to all the moms because without the moms, any of this wouldn't be possible. All of these ladies are uh, truly inspiring, past and present. So now we have some time for some questions. And I know um, Julie has some questions for Susan, so we can go ahead and start there. And if um, anybody else has questions, you can let me know in the chat. Thanks, Kelly. I um, just want to say also thank you to everyone who participated, all the gals in town, staff, uh, John, for bringing Zale's story to us. That was absolutely terrific. And um, Oh, I think we lost, yeah, well, anyway, I know time's running. But for Susan, I noticed you taking notes and I wonder how the museum uh, goes about decide, collecting and deciding what and whose stories will be featured in the museum. And can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, that's a really great question and it's very hard. I mean, we try to be really contemporary, we try to be addressing women who represent something that's going on in the world right now, um, that did something early on that led to where we are right now. So we follow a lot of the months, you know, the months, Black History Month and um, National History Month and things like that. So there's, there's a lot of different things that we do throughout the year that, um, that provide an editorial calendar for us. But our um, program group really keeps on top of everything that's happening in the news and tries to really be relevant. You know, relevance is one of the key things today in anything that you're doing. So I think they've done a pretty good job, like the article that we had about Kamala Harris on the front of our website, because an artist did a portrait of her shattering the glass ceiling and the portrait is all broken glass. And so that became a really unique way to look at her. So. There are plenty of women's stories. We're gonna have room for a lot of women's stories. And we really want the stories, not only of, of women who are famous, but women who are not so famous, whose stories still matter. Oh, thank you so much. And again, thank you so much for being here with us today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you everyone for joining us. I don't see um, any questions in the chat. So I think we will go ahead and wrap it up here. We appreciate you all joining us on your Saturday to celebrate Women's History Month. Everyone have a great day.